In 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, Peter is giving, um, uh, it was a chapter on, on the end times. He's talking about the last days. And at the end, in verse 14, he says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given, wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking and in them of things in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware that you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the air of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. You know, as Peter's talking about this, and I think this will usually can get crossed over to all of Paul's writings. But Peter is talking about the end times in this section before. Uh, when he mentions these writings of Paul. And if you go to the end of Paul, we've talked about this in our previous study, but 1 Corinthians 15, Paul claims that he was given a mystery. A mystery, something unknown. And, and Peter here is saying that some of the things that uh, Paul has written, that God has given to him, are hard to understand. Not impossible, difficult, challenging. Require maybe a greater study, greater prayer time. I believe ultimately that knowledge, that, under, that, that wisdom, understanding of the word is a gift from the Lord. And, it's, and, uh, and that it's found through his personal revelation, him teaching us the word of God. Yes, we should study. Yes, we should be students of the word. But the full understanding, I believe the spirit of God guides us as the church in the understanding of it. Uh, but as we're getting here to this Second Thessalonians chapter 2, I believe we're in one of these sections that Peter was referencing uh, that are harder to understand. Um, and so as we go through this this morning, I want you to be aware that we're going to go through a lot, of, a lot of different things. We're going to be referencing some different things. I'm going to try to go through it fairly quickly. We're still moving through it. We could easily spend a month in this chapter. I'm, I'm hoping to get through it this morning. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so... As we're going through it, uh, if, if some of it is difficult, well, I think it's difficult by intent. It's plainly there, but it's also, in a sense, it's plainly concealed. And, and, and that's a, a thing that the Spirit is able to do. It's intended to need to be sought out. It's intended to cause greater study. And why are some of these things harder? Well, some of them, as we'll get to, you'll see, are very simple. But a lot of things are built one upon another, like building blocks. And if one of your building blocks, if you put the wrong blocks in the wrong place, you could, you could end up with some wrong conclusions. Um, and so as we're going through those things, I'm going to try to walk you through this chapter uh, here in 2 Thessalonians uh, to the best of my ability. So let's go ahead and flip over there. No pages turning. I guess you guys are already all there. All right. Chapter 2. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by the spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. The word translated come here right at the end is most commonly translated present, as if the day of the Lord is at hand, is here is a, a reference that, uh, that Paul is clearly addressing that the church was concerned that perhaps they were in the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is a period of seven years, written of, we first find from, uh, from the prophet Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, he gives a prophecy of 70 weeks. 69 weeks until the coming of the Messiah, that's before Jesus came. And then the Messiah, it says, will be cut off, but not for himself, Jerusalem will be destroyed, the temple will be destroyed, um, and, and there will be a final week coming after those things, and it will be initiated by the signing of a peace treaty. 
with Israel. And, that, and that'll start a seven-year tribulation broken into two, three-and-a-half-year chunks. And that, again, is out of Daniel chapter 9. And we call that day typically the Great Tribulation. That's a, a normal term for it, but another typical term that you'll see for it is the Day of the Lord. The Day of the Lord is a reference, usually you'll find it is a reference to this time period uh, of the Great Tribulation. A reference to the final seven years. These are the final seven years on earth before Christ sets up his messianic kingdom. It's the final seven years of the rule where there is a man that sits on the throne that's not Jesus Christ. But after that, it's God himself who will rule in the kingdom. And that's an exciting thing for us. That's a very exciting thing. We go, man, I look forward to being in his kingdom. I look forward to the thousand-year reign of Christ and then the eternal reign of Christ. Right? And, um, and so I am thankful for those things. But he describes these things in a lot of detail. Uh, but they also, uh, as we get through them, there's going to be building upon these different understandings. And that's what Paul is doing. And we can see within these things that he is talking to them with the assumption and the understanding that they already know what he's talking about. And we know that he's already been teaching this church about these things uh, from what we've already gone through in First and Second Thessalonians so far. The church was already familiar with these different doctrines. And he has... Two topics, right? The concerning the coming of Jesus Christ, which is the final seven years, and then our gathering to him. That's what we're talking about, two different things. As he says there in verse one, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. Two separate events. I believe those are, are in distinctly put there as two different things that he's addressing. One being a reference to the tribulation, the second being a reference to to the rapture. Verse 2, Paul addresses them and tells them not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. It's evident that there was some kind of fraudulent letter or teacher or someone who has claimed they had a special word from God was teaching that they were already in the great tribulation. That's what was going on. It's probably why it's, a, it's not probably. And it's why this letter was written, is Paul is clarifying this understanding that they had. They uh, we know from First Thessalonians they are looking for the return of Christ, and this was apparently shaking them and troubling them. Now remember, this church went through a lot of persecution. We've talked about that already. They were uh, uh, dealing with uh, immense amounts of physical persecution, but I want to read to you some of the definitions. What does it mean when it's talking about that don't be shaken uh, and troubled? To be shaken is to be unsettled, to be confused, to be troubled, to be upset. The phrase to be shaken from the mind is also translated to be agitated, to become unsettled, to be thrown into confusion, to be shaken from one's composure, to lose one's head. The uh, aorist tense refers to the initial shock of excitement, or it regards the action without reference to its progress. And not to be shaken in the mind uh, is also carrying through, meaning not to be shaken in their, in their sense, in their wits, in their thinking, in their way of thinking, in their sanity. It means to not be disturbed, to be upset, to be anxious, to be troubled, to be nervously wrought up, to be terrified, to be alarmed, to alarm oneself, to be excited. The present tense describes this as a continuous state. It is a state of alarm that has resulted from being shaken. It's an anxious, it's a nervous, it's a thought that they can't get out of their heads. They're greatly concerned, they're perplexed, they're, they're wondering what's going on. They're, they're worried about what is going on. Why were they worried? The church has already received a lot of persecution. To me, it makes the most sense uh, why they're worried. This is my opinion, because I think they're worried, well, if we're, in, if we're in the tribulation, then we miss the rapture. I think that's probably the primary worry that they're having. Uh, and I believe that that is what the, the, what the word teaches, is with the pre-tribulation rapture. You could argue they were afraid to be going through the tribulation. You could argue that. Uh, if you remember this church, for me, some of the things, I'm going to give some thoughts. I'll, you guys, it's the word of God that stands, but I'm going to give thoughts why I feel it's the rapture. Uh, it says, one, that earlier it said that their faith was above measure. They're already being persecuted very strongly. If they found out now it was just a matter of a few more years and Christ would set up his eternal reign, would they be frightened? 
or they'd be excited if they were expecting to go through this tribulation. If they were expecting it to come quickly, if they found out they were in it, would they be like, oh, really? It's already, sometimes already passed? Would that be good news or bad news? Right? And, and so um, I think if they were expecting to go through it, that this wouldn't have shaken them. This wouldn't have had this effect on them. But if they were, in fact, expecting the rapture, and they found out somebody comes, well, God said we're already in the, in the tribulation. I got this letter from Paul. And look, he explains we're already in the tribulation. A false letter. A false letter. Uh, uh, that, that, that somebody could be greatly troubled. We're already in it. Well, we either had a great misunderstanding or we're not saved. <laughs> There's a big problem. Something is greatly wrong in the way we perceive things. And, that, and that's what I think is going on. And so would the, would the fact of his return and the, and the tribulation, is that enough to say that why they were shaken and troubled? I don't think so. I think it was a reference to that, but it, but it, it could potentially be, and some people read it that way. Uh, if they were looking for Christ to come get them before the great tribulation again, I think this would make great sense. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, tells us this about the church of Thessalonians. He said, You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. If this is what they were waiting for, if this is what they are expecting, if this is what they are hoping for, why are they troubled by it? Why are they troubled by it? And so I guess to me that is one of the perplexing things because it says they're waiting for his son from heaven. If they're expecting that they go through the tribulation as they're waiting, then you expect that over all their faith this is um, bad news physically, good news spiritually. But they're shaken even in the mind. And, uh, and so that would be why I believe they're looking at it so, so shaking. Either way, the church is looking for the return of Christ. And... Um, Either way, they had a lot of physical persecution still going on. They had a lot of things going on. Just because the church, uh, from what I believe, is not going through the Great Tribulation does not mean they will not experience a lot of persecution. Okay? The church is not exempt in any way from persecution. It is promised persecution. But uh, in this sense, I think that there was this... Um, this worry, and I don't see this church as being such a strong church of faith, having such panic over the fact that they were expecting to go through it. But either way, this false teaching had caused worry enough, and it seems that someone sent a, a letter to Paul to clarify. This false teaching, you know, we take often notes of physical persecution as an attack against the church when people are put in jail for their faith. Uh, when people are fined for their faith, when people are martyred for their faith. We, we take note of those things, and we call that clear per persecution. And this is another form, though, of spiritual attack, twisting of the truth. This is an attack at the faith of the church here in, in Thessalonica. This is lies aimed at destroying their faith or trust in God. And I think that this type of persecution, this type of onslaught of the enemy is prevalent in our time. I think this is a common attack in our time is false teaching, false teaching. And I think it's also, in a sense, it's, it is an attack and a form of persecution that is constantly launched at the church. Who are they trying to deceive? They're trying to deceive you, trying to deceive me. Uh, I, again, I don't think we normally think of it in that sense, but I believe it's absolutely spiritual attack, and it's uh, hostile towards our faith. And it's also hostile towards the word of God and those who embrace all of it. We see this in, in uh, minor ways and we see this in large ways. Even uh, right now, in some ways, I think we're seeing these, these attacks. You know, the uh, uh, Biden administration has something on their website. Within 100 days, it'll be illegal to preach about uh, homosexuality and say preach. But they want to treat it as a hate crime if you mention it. If I agree with the Bible on it, they want to make that a crime. Um, I, I think that's a form of persecution. Form, you have to agree with us. You have to take this view, trying to get me away from the word of God. Our schools, I think we can see this with our kids, uh, whether it's at the young ages or at the, at the academic level, at the, at the college level. We are pre our kids are pressurized to accept a, a view that the world is millions or billions, billions really just in general, of years old. The earth is probably about 6,000 years old. That's how old it is. How do I know? Because the guy who created it 
has a <laughs> lineage, and, but it's about 6,000 years old, right? That's how I know. Uh, I don't believe that's in the face of science at all, but the, but the, the uh, higher education and even the high schools or junior highs, what will they try to do? No, it's billions of years. You need to accept science. They're trying to force it. It's a form of, of, of trying to dis, uh, get us to distrust the word of God. It's an attack on the faith is what it is. And there's social uh, pressure put on people to accept sin as good and not call it evil or wrong. There's that pressure that's put on. Again, I think that's a form of an attack. It's a, it's a form of a persecution against truth, against, uh, against the church. Economically, some co- companies have resistance because they take biblical stances, because they don't support different things. If you recall, I think it was last year, and I know things have changed with them, but, uh, but Chick-fil-A was kept out of an airport, right, because of their stance uh, on, a, on abortion, I believe it was, or homosexuality, one of, one of those. Uh, and they had resistance uh, of places trying to not allow them in then for business. And, and these, are, I believe, are forms of persons where the world is trying to say, you need to become like us. And, and these people, what are they ultimately trying to do? They're trying to undermine the truth of God. And we need to be watching out for these false teachers or these attacks that come. And we need to not be shaken by them. That's what's important for us. So this church, what is wrong is that they heard this word, they disagreed with what they previously understood, what Paul had taught them, and they're shaken by it because they're, they're thinking, but this is from God. And, that, and that's as, where we see where this problem is coming, is the church is struggling, struggling enough that they say, we need to send somebody to Paul, and we need to get clarity on what's going on here. We need some, we need some guidance. In the last days, in the, in the final time, the last seven-year period, the Antichrist, also the man that's gonna be, that is mentioned here, uh, the man of sin, the lawless one, son of perdition, the Antichrist, in the last days, he'll la- launch the greatest assault on followers of Christ spiritually, intellectually, and physically. And it'll be the worst time of persecution in the history of the world. Those final uh, seven years, really the final 42 months, the back half of that tribulation. This church in Thessalonica was doing outstanding, again, in the midst of insane physical persecution. But this false statement was alarming enough, again, that they needed clarity. This was shaking them. It wasn't the physical persecution that was getting to this church, but perhaps this doctrinal error. The enemy said, well, if I can't get them to surrender through, through physical, then what about through crafty plotting? Can I get them to doubt their faith? Can I undermine their faith. And we are warned in the last days also that, this, that there will be more false teaching. 2 Timothy chapter uh, 4 and 1 Timothy chapter 4 both warn us of false teachers being prevalent in the end times. And we need to stick to the word of God and not give place to false teaching. Acts chapter 2 verse uh, 42, it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread And in prayers, we can't surrender those. The first one on that list is the apostles' doctrine. We should be able to take anything that you hear and measure it back to the word of God. If it doesn't measure up, cast it out. It's a lie. Don't entertain it anymore. And that's what what he's telling us right here. And he's going to go on to tell that to the church. He he leads this church. And And the way I look at the way Paul handles this with him, he deals with it in a very gracious way but also a very direct way. He's bringing them out of the air, and he's reminding them, he'll remind them in verse 5, of his, uh, that he taught them already these things. If you remember what I taught you. And we need to go back to the word of God. This is our final authority. We see this also launched in different ways. We see it through, through Mormonism, through Jehovah's Witness. Oh, well, there's this new revelation. Don't be, displayed. Don't, don't, don't be dismayed by it. Don't be worried about it. Don't let it cause any distress in your heart. If they have a new doctrine, don't, don't go see what it is. It's not from the Lord. Continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Continue in fellowship with the body. Continue in the breaking of bed. Continue in prayer. We should be maintaining those things. How long? Till he comes back. Till he comes back. That's how long. We continue steadfastly in those things. So at any time, if you're confused about what you're hearing, return to the word. 
Return to the word. Verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And then the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Arrogant guy. Uh, the most arrogant guy as it has ever lived in all of history. But he starts this out, let no one deceive you. The enemy is seeking to destroy our confidence in God and his word, and he does it through crafty plotting. Again, it would seem that it was, Paul is hinting at that, that somebody forged a letter in his name or something of that nature was given to the church that caused them this great distress. And, and here in verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means. By any means. If you, if you hear somebody calling you a different way than what the Bible has already taught, don't entertain it. You don't need to hear them out. They're wrong. Don't be deceived by any means. Now, Paul gives two things that precede here also the tribulation. He also, he goes on, he gives some evidence. He goes, listen, guys, I'm going to bring you back to some other doctrines that I taught you you need to think through that I'm going to help you understand you're not yet in the tribulation. And he gives two things that precede the tribulation. The falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed. Falling away, meaning apostasy, a willful act to abandon one's faith in Christ. It's also talked about in other places like 1 Timothy chapter 4 and 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm referencing some of these places. You're welcome if you want them after. Uh, We don't have time to go through all of them this morning, but they're not just right here in this section. The second one that is listed here is the man of sin must be revealed. Okay, so he's given them two things that neither of them have happened yet. It does not say that the man of sin had to be revealed before the rapture, but before the tribulation. Before the day of the Lord. Uh, And it's going to be revealed to those who are believers and alive at this time. They'll know who he is. Who is that? Well, that could be the church if the church is there. If the church has already been raptured, it could be those who have placed their faith in Christ after the church is removed. Uh, But it will be obvious when he comes to power. Not necessarily to the world, but to those who belong to Christ. They They will look. They will see. You'll not be guessing you think he's the Antichrist? You, know, you think he's the false one? It'll be clear. He said, you guys will understand it. There, there's several clues. Um, some of it is in the fact of his name. The name of uh, the beast will it'll be 666. Six, six. His name will total those uh, numbers. Revelation chapter 13. The actions that he'll take. Obviously, he signs a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. Obviously, he's a very powerful individual. And we'll see a lot of other signs that will... Um, that will be there also that we'll get into here in just a minute. And he will be revealed before the great tribulation. And so they'll be able to spot him before the seven-year period. So he could come on the scene before we're actually even raptured. We could be like, hey, there's the Antichrist. Maybe he comes on the scene 10 years before the peace treaty, maybe at the peace treaty. He's eventually going to rise to power. The, the primary time that he is in full power, the dictator over the world, is the back half of the tri- tribulation, 42 months from the way I understand it. Uh, and that's out of Revelation 13. We'll get there in a minute. But this man is the opposite of the true Christ. He's the Antichrist, and he's also a false Christ. As God uh, was embodying everything that was perfect, Jesus Christ, the true Messiah, this man embodies everything that is evil. He is the man of sin. The son of destruction, uh, our opposite of salvation is this word uh, perdition, the son of destruction, the seed of Satan. He's also called the little horn, the king of fierce countenance, the prince that shall come, the desolator, the willful king, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the lawless one, the antichrist, the beast, and he's ultimately a false messiah. So what do we mean by antichrist and false Christ? What, What are the... He is one that is absolutely 100% and opposes the truth, the word of God, and Jesus Christ. But he also presents himself as a false savior. He, he puts himself in the place of Christ. That's even why we see that he's in the temple presenting himself as God. He's a false messiah. So he is one that is uh, not only against, but he is trying to take the office of Jesus Christ. 
I want everybody to look to me to be saved. That's essentially his role. I want everybody to worship only me. And we'll, we'll talk about some of these things in just a minute. That, that is what he is saying. Who opposes and exalts himself above all, it says, that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he sits on the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. First note, I want to just explain this, is that there's a temple. And that means the temple must be rebuilt. There are some people who don't interpret it that way. Some people think this is a, um, a, uh, an analogy of the church, right? And, and uh, some people, even like uh, John Calvin, he thought this is a reference to the Pope. That's who he thought it was. This is, an office, this is a reference to the office of the Pope, somebody who claims to be the vicar of Christ, uh, but, but is not, and elevates himself above the rest of mankind. Uh, and so he looked at it as the office of the Pope, uh, there's other people who have looked at it in different ways. How do we come up? How do we know? Well, I look at this text and I go, you know what? I think it's written literally just to be understood how it is. And so if it says, listen, guys, here's one of the things you need to look for. He'll go into the temple. He'll proclaim himself as God. It's not written in a poetry sense. It's not written in, in some kind of uh, uh, a way that it would seem that he's uh, speaking. And it's not in a parable or something of that nature. It's very plain. And so I think that he was giving very plain direction. Here's what to expect. And so it basically comes down to your, uh, your hermeneutics, the way you interpret Scripture. Now, I'm not saying other people don't believe that this will be a literal fulfillment, but let me give you an example. Uh, when I'm talking about I'm expecting it to happen exactly as it's written. Exactly as it's written. He's going to go into the temple. He's going to profane the temple. It's going to be the abomination of desolation. Uh, and he is going to proclaim himself as God. I'm expecting these things all to be literal. So let me give you some examples. I'm, I'm going to give you an example the best way I can understand it. Let's say somebody said, listen, um, somebody's going to come to your house in a, in a white Ford pickup, and they're going to come up, and they're going to knock on your door uh, when it's time to go. All right, and somebody comes in a blue Chevy pickup, and they're in your yard and they're shouting, hey, you ready? And the person in the house is thinking, is that the right person? So in my mind, you're right, you, have the, you have a pickup, you have somebody that's at the house, and they're there to pick you up. And so in my mind, I'm going, that's not the right guy. I think God told me, white pickup, and he's going to knock on the door. So I'm waiting. Other people would be like, you're totally missing it. That's the guy. It's a pickup. He's in the yard. He's shouting at you. That's the one God sent. All right, I'm going, no, I think God was very literal. When he said white truck, I think he meant white truck, not blue. Uh, and so we can end up with these different views. Some people believe that it was fulfilled through, uh, through Titus, who became emperor of Rome about 10 years after the destruction of the temple. He walked in and he profaned uh, the temple when he destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. And it says that he offered sacrifices at the temple. But we don't see that he set himself up and proclaimed to be God. Uh, does he later, as Caesar claimed, uh, um, claimed to be a god? He does later, but not at the temple. And also, it says here, exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits in the, in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Caesars put themselves as a god. They didn't erase the worship of all the rest. So I don't see this as a literal fulfillment. I see it as an almost, there's the guy in the yard shouting. Right? It's like a foreshadowing. Antiochus Epiphanes was, was another foreshadowing about 170 B.C., uh, who also went into the temple, uh, erected a, a statue of Zeus, and, and offered a slaughtered pig in the temple of God. Uh, it's another foreshadowing, and we see that as a foreshadowing. We know that wasn't it. How do we know that wasn't it? Well, one, Paul tells us here to watch for it. Jesus told us to watch still for the abomination of desolation. In other words, neither of them counted it as fulfilled. Uh, and so... I don't count it as fulfilled. I am looking for a literal fulfillment of these things. So since I'm looking for a literal fulfillment, I'm expecting in the future, sometime between now and whenever the great tribulation hits the middle period, because that's, I believe, when he does this, there will be a temple built again in Jerusalem. And they will be doing sacrifices again in Jerusalem, I believe, at that temple from what the Bible teaches. I believe there will be a fourth temple that will be built in the millennial kingdom. Why? Because it talks about that in Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48. And again, I believe, because it says it's going to be a temple and it gives all the dimensions, I think it's going to be built, and I think it's going to be built to the dimensions that it gives. And that's why. 
And it's not that other people don't necessarily believe that that scripture is inspired. They allegorize it. They go, well, I do think it was from the Lord, but this temple must represent the church because the church is also the temple of God. I'm like, okay, but I don't think the temple of the, uh, the, the church is getting these physical measurements and different things. And it has some value, can have some meaning, it does. Um, but I believe in a literal fulfillment. And that's how I land with these things. And, and I encourage you to study these things uh, for yourself. But I have great confidence uh, when I look at the first coming, the way Christ came, that the second coming is also going to be very literally fulfilled. Very literally fulfilled. Now, Jesus also warns about this man that's coming, this man of sin, as he comes in his own name, as it says here, showing himself that he is God. John chapter 5, verse 43, Jesus says, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. I believe that is a reference ultimately to the, to the Antichrist, to the false Messiah that would come. Could it be applied to other people throughout history? It could, but I think its final fulfillment will be in this Antichrist figure coming, this man of sin, this lawlessness one. This false Christ will be accepted by all those except those who trust in Jesus Christ. You will come down in the end times to two religious systems only. Now, in one part, we already have only two religious systems. You either are believing truth or you're believing a lie. Okay, but it's going to be very narrowed down that you're going to either follow this false Christ, not Islam, not Jehovah's Witness, not Mormon, you're going to follow this false Christ, or you're going to follow Jesus Christ. And those are the only two. And we're going to see that, that, that it's going to be very narrow. Revelation chapter 13, verses 5 through 8, and it says, And he was given a mouth, this is talking about this Antichrist, Speaking great things and blasphemies. He's, he's constantly speaking these kinds of things. He's saying he, he boasts great things and is constantly blaspheming God. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. It's 42 months is the back half of the tribulation, 1260 days. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. He becomes very powerful. The most evil man, again, in history. He is commonly referred to in the Revelation as the beast. He'll put... Um, Something, possibly an idol in the temple, that uh, again is an abomination, and again that's spoken of with Daniel, and it actually remains in the temple for 1,290 days, it would seem, according to Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. 30 days even past uh, when, when Christ returns. And all who are not saved will worship this beast. This reign of 42 months will be the back half of the tribulation of the final 42 months before Christ comes to defeat him. And he will come and he will defeat him. And this person before these 42 months, he already has a lot of influence. He's already in a political position of power. He obviously already signed a peace treaty three and a half years before this time. But there is some things, and, and I want to just try to bring you up to speed on. They're, they're, again, building upon things. So we're going to go back and look at some prophecy. But there is... Ten kings that are prophesied to be here at this time in the tribulation. Uh, uh, and these ten kings are essentially the, the resurgence of the Roman Empire. And somewhere, it seems about the mid-tribulation, that the Antichrist is going to subdue or kill or defeat three of them. And the other seven will submit. And that's essentially when he becomes the ruler of the world, the, the, the key figure. And we get that from Daniel chapter 2. King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who was given a dream of an image with a head of gold, its chest and arms of, of silver and thighs of bronze, and its legs of iron and feet partially of iron and partially of clay. He was given this dream, and Daniel was given the meaning of it to, to give to the, to the king. And this was a prophetic of the kingdoms of the world, this dream that was given to King Nebuchadnezzar. The head of gold was Babylon. The chest and arms were the Medo-Persian Empire. 
the thighs of bronze were greased, and the legs of iron were Rome. The final kingdom of men given in this prophetic timeline was the resurgence of the Roman Empire under these ten kings or the ten toes. And it'll be partially weak and partially strong, iron mixed with clay. It'll be the final kingdom of men, and then God will destroy the image. It says then there's a, a rock that is cut without hands, and it's and it cast at the image, and it becomes a great mountain and consumes the whole earth, referring to the kingdom of Christ. This supernatural kingdom, this non-human uh, kingdom will come and will fill the earth after this final uh, re- uh, kingdom of the resurgence of the Roman Empire. And that's why when you're listening to Bible prophecy or different things, why people are always talking still about the Roman Empire is because of the prophecy there in Daniel and that that is what the Antichrist, where he will rule from. Back to, to 2 Thessalonians chapter uh, 2, verse 5, it says, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? So they're getting worried, but, but he's reminding them, you guys already know you should be looking for these different things. You haven't, seen this, you haven't seen this man of sin come on the stage yet, have you? Have you seen the great apostasy taking place? He listens to these. Are you seeing these things taking place? Has that happened? Have you seen the abomination of desolation? Has anybody gone into the temple yet and proclaimed themselves as God? Has this happened yet? And so he's walking them back through their previous teaching. And um, it's interesting. Again, we can note at a young age for this church how much Paul taught them about the end times. But more importantly, I think what we grab here is this phrase, do you not remember? Because it's again a call back to the apostolic teaching that was given to them. And that's where we need to be grounded in the word of God. As these false teachings continue to spread, as, as false teaching continues to rise, we need to have our feet planted firmly and our confidence firmly in the word of God. When they heard this false report, this false letter, they should have spotted it as a fake by the fact that it disagreed. As soon as they heard, oh, no, there's this new revelation, that that should have been the first bells up in their head that went fake, fake, lies, attack. But they opened their hearts. When you open your hearts to an attack, it can become, you become very vulnerable. And so he's reminding them, do you not remember so as we hear things, we need to take it back to the word of God, and we need to check it to there. Verse 6, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains, restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The lawless one who is already at work. Again, a reference to the Antichrist. 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. It says, Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest, that none of them were of us. So the spirit of Antichrist or of lawlessness is one and the same, and it was already at work in the time of, of the early church. The spirit was already at work, but there's something restraining it. There is something uh, that is holding back these demonic forces. What is it? Who is restraining this evil that will re- be removed? Well, first Paul says, you know what is restraining You see that in verse 6? You know what is restraining. This church already knew. The church in Thessalonica, he didn't have to explain to them what that was. They already knew what was restraining this evil. So what was it? Well, now he says, "He he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So whatever is restraining eventually is is removed or is taken out of the way. And and this restraint is no longer there. Well, the end times hasn't come yet. So what has been restraining since the time of the apostles to the current day? There's actually a lot of different opinions on this. I'm going to give you what what I'd consider just the top two this morning. You're welcome to go study it more. Uh, But 
the restrainer is first given in a, in a, in a, um, in a more of a reference just to it, like a, um, a neuter now, just in the sense that it's a, like a knit. Whatever it is, it's restraining. The second time it is mentioned, it is given a masculine noun. Like it's referring to a person. Uh, and so I believe that, as I look at that, I go, I believe it's referring to the Holy Spirit. That's what I believe it's referring to, the, the one that is restraining or holding it back now. The other leading thought is that it's actually Rome or government. That would be the other leading thought. Both of these actually go back to the second century, those two views. You can find both of those views in the, in the writings of the early church fathers. Uh, and, the, and the shepherd of Hermaeus, I believe it is, in the... Um, and Irenaeus, Irenaeus both write about this in, in the 130 to 180 range um, for some early thought. But either way, they are not inspired by the Word of God. This is the inspired Word of God. So this is the uh, leading authority. But these are the two leading thoughts is that it's either government or Rome that is restraining evil. And we've talked about civil government and that it has a role and it's been given the sword for a purpose. And it's supposed to uphold righteous judgment. Well, when the Antichrist gets into power, he takes over the, all the governments of the world and therefore removes any government's ability to restrain evil. That's one view. And then the restrainer is removed. Um, the other view is that it is the Holy Spirit. And as I've mentioned, that, that's mine. Why? Because he's mentioned in the masculine sense here would be one reason. I believe that, that it's referencing more of a he, not just a, uh, an it. And... He also says that they know, no, ba -bum, let me go back. And you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time, for the mystery of the lawless one is already at work. Only, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So this you know what is restraining. There's two thoughts. And, and translators argue over what is meant by this you know. It's either one that they know personally. Or the other is that they know doctrinally. Do they know from experience what is restraining evil? Or do they know from knowledge what is restraining evil? Now if they know personally, I would look at that and I go, well, what is restraining evil in your life? Has the Holy Spirit restrained any evil in you? Has he kept you from sin at all? Have you seen that in your life? Because if it's a personal experience, I think that's an argument for the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. And when he has come, he'll convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So if the church knew by experience the Spirit of God that convicts men of sin and gives them strength to resist sin or lawlessness, then I think this would be fitting. And I think that the Spirit does that in our lives. He convicts us of sin. He keeps us from committing evil. Have you had that conviction in your life? I've had that. Also, we see in Job chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power, only do not lay a hand on his person. He had to get permission before he was allowed. Until God lifted that protection, he wasn't allowed to interfere with Job. So again, I go, well, whose ministry is that? I said, that's the Holy Spirit. And, I, and so I believe these are some significant spots. They're not the only spots. I think there's references back in Genesis 6 prior to the flood uh, that you could also read in other areas that, could, that would suggest that it's the Holy Spirit. Um, I have a hard time thinking of this early church that is even mixed Jew and Gentile really thinking of Rome as the restrainer of evil as they're being persecuted. It's just a hard thought for me to wrap my head around where I'm like, they're like, Okay, as soon as Rome's taken, it's like, what? but Rome is the, is the empire that is resurged that the Antichrist rules. Uh, so for me, that becomes a very difficult, I, I'm, I just doesn't square up in my head. The Holy Spirit, to me, makes really great sense. 
of course, since I believe the church is already taken out of the way, if the Spirit, if the Spirit of God indwells the church. And, and of course, then that requires a pre-tribulational view. Uh, that there, and I don't believe it means that the Spirit is entirely absent. It means that he's no longer restraining. He's removed. He's, his hand's lifted. doesn't mean he's no longer present on the earth, but his hands are lifted. He's no longer restraining this evil. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonder. Satan is the power behind the Antichrist. He is not a normal man. He is uh, given power from Satan himself. There will be signs and lying wonders or deceiving wonders, supernatural powers. We talk about that again in Revelation 13. I'd encourage you to go read it. Um, some call it the false trinity. In Revelation 13, you see that you have Satan who gives power to the false Christ, and you have the false prophet. Uh, and so you there, in a sense, you have a false father, a false son, and a false spirit performing signs and wonders to deceive the people, an imposter. The false son and prophet are the first two in the lake of fire. It's interesting because in some sense, it almost seems that God allows the imagery to follow through because they're trying to be a false Messiah and Christ is the first of the resurrection from the dead. And here, this person presents himself as the Messiah and they are the first to be thrown into the lake of fire. They are the first to receive the judgment of the dead. Uh, so we see there that he gains that seat as the chief of the sinners among men. Takes the title from Paul. Um, and so as we, as we look at these things, it is a dark and evil time with a lot of great deception. Why is that an important thing? Well, he's telling us these things often because we're not supposed to be deceived. It's not that we're supposed to focus on all this, all this doom. He's, he's, allow, he's know, know these things so that if you see the stage starting to be set, don't freak out. But be watchful. Be looking for the return of the Christ. That's what he's calling for us to do as the church. He says, hey, when these things, be, be thinking about the way in which you are living in his return. This is the things he's trying to tell the church. Be mindful. You don't want him to come at a time that you're not expecting. Now, and, and in the sense that you're, you're off living in the world. He says, don't, don't be like that. Be a faithful servant. And remember that through all these things, seven years, 42 months, this guy rules. But then Christ rules. For a thousand years, then forevermore. And we need to remember those things. Verse 11, it says, God will send a strong delusion on these people that are following the beast. This is not because he does not want these people to be saved. It's because they've already rejected the truth and are beyond turning back. These people have crossed beyond the line. Their hearts will be hardened. They have rejected the gospel. They have rejected God's offer of salvation. They have placed their allegiance to the beast. Verse 12, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There's only two sides. I think that's one of the most important things we can grab sometimes out of this stuff, and that's what's really clarified at the end times. There's only two sides. Listen this morning, you're on one of two sides. You're either with Jesus or you're with Satan. There's nowhere in between. There's no neutral ground in this fight. You're all, you belong to one person's camp. There's no other camps. There isn't a third piece of this pie. It's only got two halves. One half is Jesus, the other half is Satan. And you're either believing the truth of Jesus Christ or you're under the lies of Satan. There is no in-between. And my encouragement to you is place firm confidence in the rock in Jesus Christ and in his word. If you haven't placed your faith in Christ, now is the time. Place your faith in Christ. Share your faith with people who don't know him. Be praying for the lost. But there's only two sides. Now listen, though, this, as, they, as he talks about this, as he describes these, ple these people, he said they had pleasure in unrighteousness. I want, I want that to bite you a little bit this morning. I want it to bite you a lot if that's you. 
pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, no, I'm not talking about a, a stumbling. This is pleasure. This, this is, are we delighting in sin? Are we looking to be satisfied in the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eye or the pride of life? Because that's, that's a sign of these people that, uh, uh, that, that end up being deceived by the, by the beast. They had pleasure in unrighteousness. Not a stumbling, not a war, not that they fell to it. If they had pleasure in this unrighteousness. Now, I know our flesh, we're tempted. I know that there are things somewhere in your life that you look at the world and you go, that looks satisfying. But 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Listen, we all stumble. We all make mistakes. We're not perfect except by the blood of Christ, this side of eternity. We're still going to struggle with the sin nature. We will have a new body, and when Jesus comes back, we'll get it instantaneous, and this sin nature will be gone. Thank you, Jesus. But until then, we will make war with our own flesh. And it does not mean that we're not tempted, but we should not be participants in the things of the world for grabbing pleasure out of unrighteous things. These should be wars within us, not pleasures that we accept that are our home, that have a place. And so I encourage you to, to look upon that and go, you know what, Lord, I don't want anything unrighteous. I don't want to be looking for pleasure in anything that is displeasing to you because I want my satisfaction to be found in Jesus Christ. And I know my ultimate satisfaction is when I'm with you for eternity and this sin nature is gone. So if there is these areas, church, fight them in your own life. If you stumble, God is amazing, his grace, but fight them and use the tools. Be in the word. If you are not a student of the truth, then the lies will become easy. You need to be in the word every morning, every night. Verse 13, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for, obtaining, for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. The word traditions there is doctrines or teachings. So you're, so you're aware that we can get interesting with, with traditions, uh, but it's totally fitting to look at that as doctrines or teachings that have been handed to them. Paul is going back to thanking God for them and reminds them they are chosen for salvation. He encourages them that the Spirit will continue to grow them and reminds them that they are saved by the blood of Christ. You know, we can't see those who are chosen in the list, but we can see those who are being sanctified. And then he tells them to stand fast. Do not give way to other teachings, false prophets, nor be troubled. And so also this morning, I encourage you to take caution against false teachers. Take great caution and don't give ear to their teaching. Those who twist the word or claim a divine message that is not really from God. Beware of false prophets. Always compare what you hear to the word of God. If it disagrees, stay with the word. Listen, the false prophet takes you away from the truth. God brings you to himself, to the truth. Don't be deceived. God does not disagree with his word, right? And so stay with the word. Verse 16, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work and word. Do not let hardship or false doctrine rob you of the joy of the Lord. Remember, uh, at the end of the study of the end times, is the return of Jesus Christ and the establishment of his kingdom. The emphasis of the end times is not on the Antichrist, it is on the true Christ. The Antichrist rules for months, the eternal king rules forever. Okay? And so we need to remember that as we study these things, that we are not overwhelmed when we read what is coming upon the earth, but we also remember what is coming after. 
We need to make sure our hope is firmly planted in Jesus Christ. Firmly planted, not shakable. We should find great joy and comfort knowing that we belong to him. Knowing that we will receive new bodies. Knowing that we will dwell in his kingdom, not by our righteousness, but the righteousness that was given to us by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I tell you what, I look forward to living in that kingdom. It will be a wonderful, wonderful kingdom to be a part of. Amen? Amen. Lord, I thank you for your word, Father. Lord, I pray that as we read these things, as we study these things, Father, Lord, I pray that you would encourage us as a body to, to stay away, Lord, from the things of the world that are intended to lead us away from you. Whether that be lies, Lord, of, of doctrinal sense, Lord, or lies of pleasure, Father. Lord, that we would look for our satisfaction and our joy in you. Lord, I thank you that you have written too much, so much for us, Father, to understand how things will come so that we are not deceived. And that as we see things going on around the world, Lord, that we keep our hope fixed in you. Lord, I thank you that regardless of the path that lays ahead of the, in this life, Father, that you have secured us in you for eternity. So, Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord, to run this race with endurance. Firmly trusting in you, Lord, till you bring us home. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.